This is continuous coverage. Continuous coverage. Continuous coverage. In the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell from the Hidden Killers Podcast. Hidden Killers Podcast. We're up to the fourth segment of our continuous coverage in the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell. Let's head to the courtroom. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Cross examination. So you indicate, uh, Detective, that uh, these interviews were recorded? Correct. And did you watch those again to remind you what had happened some almost four years ago? I did. And is that how you base your testimony is, is reviewing all that again? Partially, yes. And so the interview with, with uh, Lori was recorded? Correct. The one in the FAC was, yes. The interview with Tylee was recorded? Yes. The interview with Alex was recorded? I believe so, yes. And uh, and then after all these uh, interviews, then you detectives, you all get together and, and compare notes. Yeah, fair. And it was determined at that time that uh, Alex Cox was justified in self-defense of this shooting. No. Uh, were there any arrests of Alex Cox? Your Honor, may we approach? Yes. All right, we took a brief sidebar. We're back on the record now. Counsel, we were just discussing the nature of this testimony. Uh, I'll just indicate on the record the last question posed by uh, Mr. Archibald asking the detective, quote, were there any arrests of Alex Cox? Uh, Mr. Archibald, there's not an objection at this point. There was a sidebar. So uh, you can proceed with that question or you can withdraw the question or however you want to go forward with your cross at this time. Did you arrest Alex Cox on July 11th, 2019? I did not. The information that you had of an argument uh, between Charles and Lori and Alex and Tylee, uh, was that consistent with all your interviews? Mostly. And was it consistent that Tylee had uh, brought a bat to the argument to defend her mother? Correct. Was it consistent that uh, in your interviews that Charles took away the bat from Tylee? Correct. Was it consistent that... uh, Alex was hit in the head by Charles with the bat, with all these interviews. Yes. Now you say, in in your experience, uh, that Lori was not upset or acting or acting a certain way. Um, is, there, is there a correct and an incorrect way to act uh, when your estranged husband is, is shot? I don't know that there's a correct way to react to any death. It was, it left an impression upon me how unemotional she was. Thank you, Detective. I don't have anything else. All right. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. Any redirect, Ms. Blake? Yes, Your Honor.
Detective Inklin, you were asked if the Chandler Police Department made a determination that this was justifiable homicide? I was asked that, yes. Is that a determination that the police department makes? Absolutely not. How? What is the process uh, for making that determination? So, I'll, in Aaron, I'll object, Your Honor. That's outside the scope of direct. Your Honor, defense specifically asked, isn't it true that Chandler deemed this a justifiable homicide? She responded, no, I'm doing some follow-up on that. Counsel, given the circumstances where we are, I'm going to sustain that objection and find that's outside the scope of proper cross-examination and sustain that. Do you generally meet with the prosecution, the prosecutor's office at some point during an investigation? I'll yes. object, Your Honor. Relevance. Sustained. So the jury's uh, instructed to disregard that last response. Are you aware if Alex Cox is alive? I'll I object, Your Honor. Relevance. Overruled. I am aware that he is deceased. Do you know when he died? I believe it was in December the following year. Could it have been December of the same year? It could have been, yes. If Alex Cox was still alive, do you believe your agency would have made a recommendation for Ob charges to be filed? Objection. Sustained. Instruct the witness not to answer that. Your Honor, she was asked a question specifically regarding the arrest of Alex Cox by defense. I understand, and I'm limiting the nature of the cross because this is information related to Arizona for which the defendant's not on trial. Do you generally arrest someone the day of an, imbe an investigation is opened? I'll ob object relevance. Your Honor, again, they specifically that's, asked. That's overruled, and she, the witness can answer. Can you say that again? Sorry. Do you generally make an arrest the day an investigation is opened? I would say no, because generally every case is different, and it depends on the circumstances in the case and the totality of the investigation. I may have just a moment. Your Honor, may we approach briefly? Yes. Your Honor, the state has no further questions. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. And, Your Honor, the state would ask that this witness be excused. Okay. Any objection to this witness being released at this time from the defense? No objection. All right. Thank you, Detective Yanklin. Then you can be excused. Thank you for your testimony today. Would the state like to call another witness at this time? We could also consider the afternoon break if you'd like to do that before your next witness. It's up to you, Ms. Blake. Your Honor, I think this may be a good time for an afternoon break. The state had approached the court and counsel about something that would need to be heard uh, outside the presence of the jury. So, Okay, let's uh, take our break, and I'll briefly meet with you in the hall to discuss where we're at with that. All right, please. Okay, we're going back on the record on case CR 22211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. We just completed our afternoon recess, and the state is preparing to call a next witness uh, counsel. We discussed having the witness sworn to address an issue perhaps before the jury was brought in and have them take the stand to go through that first. So uh, if the state is ready, 
then we'll go ahead and have your witness brought in to be sworn, and then we'll uh, go from there. Thank you, Your Honor. The state will call uh, April Raymond. All right, now that the witness has been sworn, uh, I've been asking each witness because there's a rule called the exclusionary rule that allows uh, for witnesses to not be permitted to review or listen to other testimony during trial. So I've been asking each witness because we've got multiple viewing locations for the court, so we're not always clear on who may be observing trial testimony, um, and that would apply to those witnesses that are going to be providing testimony in the case. Uh, with this particular witness, the state, uh, and I very much appreciate you bringing to my uh, bringing it to my attention before uh, just asking the question that there may have been some exposure to pretrial testimony, but I'm not sure if there was. So perhaps just to get started, um, Ms. Smith, if you'd like to make an inquiry in that regards and see what uh, this witness may have been uh, exposed to before coming in to testify today. Um, thank you, Your Honor. And uh, I don't believe there's – I'm not sure how much of this was on the record before. In pretrial preparation, the witness mentioned that she had received a, um, a, a, ta a message, um, and just in an abundance of caution, we brought that to the attention of the court. But for the record, ma'am, will you um, state your name and spell your last name for the court reporter, please? Sure. My name is April Raymond, R-A-Y-M-O-N-D. Okay. And in pre-trial preparation, um, uh, myself and Lieutenant Ron Ball and uh, one of the lead prosecutors, Rob Wood, met with you, correct? That's correct. All right. And did we uh, mention to you the rule, the exclusionary rule, that you're not allowed to listen to any of the testimony? Yes. Okay. Have you listened to any of the testimony? No, I have not. Okay. Have you reviewed anybody's testimony from the courtroom? No, I have not. Have we reviewed any of the evidence that has appeared in this courtroom in this trial? No, I have not. Okay. Um, can you tell us about a, a, a messenger you received um, and then um, tell us whether that had any impact on your testimony here today? Uh, it was just a Facebook message um, forwarding an interview from Justin Lum with um, a member of Ms. Vallow's family. Okay. Um, and you received a Facebook messenger of a, an interview from uh, journalist Justin Lum? I did. Okay. Could and you spell the journalist's name again, last name? I, I believe it's L-U-M. Um, he's a journalist out of Arizona, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And can you tell, you say a member of... Whose family? I apologize. I know you said that. I forgot. Uh, so it was an interview with Lori's cousin that wasn't, I don't believe it was, it was just an interview that the reporter did independently, not involving this proceeding. Okay. And um, and that interview was not about this trial itself or witness testimony? No, it was not. Okay. I haven't watched the whole thing. Was there anything in that interview by Mr. Lum um, of the defendant's cousin talking about the evidence in this trial occurring now in Boise. Honestly, I didn't complete the entire interview. I saw maybe two minutes of it. I didn't watch the whole interview. So what I saw did not have anything to do with what's been happening. And with clarification from you and your team, I understood that it really didn't have anything to do with the exclusionary cause clause. Okay. But um, did you follow up on it, look at it? Did you do anything else with that link? No, I did not. Okay. Have you looked at any other links about the trial testimony in this case? No, I have not. Okay. Um, anything about um, the evidence offered in this case? No. 
Okay. Did you look at any of the comments associated with Mr. Lum's um, article? The comments on the article from Lori's cousin? Yes. Yes, I did. Okay. Did you see anything in there that um, would affect your testimony today? In my opinion, no. Okay. Um, and um, did you see any comments in there about trial testimony before Judge Boyce? No. Okay. Um, your Honor, does the court or have any other questions? I don't have any further questions with that line of uh, questioning you just went through. I will, however, allow the defense uh, at this point to ask any further questions just on that narrow, limited scope of the issue of the exclusionary rule. I'm not sure which attorney would be conducting cross in this case for the witness, Mr. Archibald. All right. Do you have any questions for Ms. Raymond on regards to the exclusionary rule before we get started with her testimony? So uh, this article that you started but didn't finish, uh, you scrolled down to read the comments about the article? Yes. And what did, were the comments saying? I mean, in general, it was about the LDS Church's influence on the proceedings. It, that was one comment. Uh, how about the other ones? I mean, I didn't read every comment, just a handful of comments. Oh. That, that's what you, that's what you remember reading was people talking about the LDS church? Yes. Anything else? No. Uh, um, in your exposure to what's happened here in case, in this case, uh, you've previously provided interviews for the media, is that right? That's correct. And have they con has the media contacted you to do follow up interviews? Judge, yes. I'm going to object. That's beyond the scope of this. I understand it's fair for cross in front of the jurors, but for this particular issue, I, I failed to see the relevance. I'll sustain that. We're narrowed in scope right here to Idaho Rule of Evidence 615, which is just the exclusionary rule, which is narrow in scope as to whether any trial testimony has been observed. So that was my question. Uh, whether being contacted by the media and to set up an, uh, another interview with you if, if you've been told what's been going on in the, in the case? No, I have not. Yeah. So have you agreed to grant interviews to uh, these media outlets? Judge, again, I understand it's, it's a question for regular cross, but as to the particular issues involving pretrial publicity or trial publicity exposure, it's beyond the scope. It, it is. And at this point, um, unless there's any further indication, the court satisfied the exclusionary rule would not have been violated by listening to any other witnesses' testimony in the case. So if you have any other questions just directly on that point, you can ask those now, and you'll have an opportunity for those other topics on cross, Mr. Archibald. Well, I, I think my question does go to what reporters have told her if she's talked to them. So have you talked to them? Yeah, and I'm going to object to vague. If we're talking about after the trial started rather than before, um, I, I still think it's not relevant. I think it's beyond the scope, but that question itself is, one, irrelevant, two, vague. Well, uh, I don't want to get too far afield here. I am going to overrule that objection, Mr. Archibald. If you can keep it narrowed to the scope of trial testimony and re-ask the question, I'll allow it. Have you been contacted by interviewers, the media, reporters, about following up on previous interviews that you did with the media? Yes, I have, and I've given them the directive from the prosecutor's office that was included in the subpoena that I received. So you told them, I'll talk to you after the trial, but not before the trial? I just sent them the directive and said I was not able to participate in any interviews at this time without any promise of any future interviews. Okay. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, counsel, thanks for going through that issue outside the presence of the jury. I think that was more appropriate. Without them hearing that issue, the court does not find there's any evidence there's been a violation of the exclusion of witness rule and the court's prior order enforcing that rule in the case. So at this time, we'll have the jurors brought in and allow for direct examination of the witness. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. And ma'am, while the jurors coming in, there's water right there if you need it. Okay. Thank you.
Wesley. All right, thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. <clears throat> All right, the witness has been sworn. We can commence with direct examination. I'll just instruct the witness, please use verbal responses to any questions and avoid talking at the same time as anyone questioning you so we can keep the record clear in the case. With that in mind, then, Ms. Smith, you can conduct your direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. Can you please introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury and spell your last name for the record, please? Of course. So my name is April Raymond. My last name is spelled R-A-Y-M-O-N-D. Okay. And ma'am, where do you live? I live in Kilauea, Hawaii. Okay. How long have you lived in Hawaii? I've lived in Hawaii for 18 years. Okay. Um, do you have any children? I do. I have two. Okay. Um, and do you know Lori Vallow? I did know Lori Vallow, yes. Okay. How did you know Lori Vallow? We met uh, as we were both members of the Hanalei branch. Okay. When you say Hanalei branch, is that a part of the LDS church? It is. It's a, a branch is a division smaller than a ward. There's not enough of population to have a ward, so we have branches. Okay. Um, do you remember when you met her at, at the branch? I do. When was that? Uh, 2016. Okay. Um, and how was it you came to know her? So uh, we were introduced um, at church, um, and she had become the president of the primary organization and had asked me to be one of her counselors. Okay. Um, and did your relationship just stay at church, or did it progress into a, a, a friendship outside the church? We did have a friendship outside of um, our Auxiliary responsibilities, yes. Okay. Um, and what was the nature of that friendship? Um, I mean, we our children spent time together. We spent time in each other's homes, celebrated holidays together. Um, did you get to know her daughter, Tylee? I did. Okay. Um, did you get to know her son, JJ? I did. Um, was her son, Colby, living in the home at the time? Uh, off and on. So he was there for a time, and then he was called on a mission, and then he uh, was home again. Um, so he wasn't there the entire time that uh, the Vallows were there. And uh, during the time that you knew uh, the defendant in Hawaii, did you know her spouse? Yes. What was her spouse's name at that time? Charles Vallow. Okay. Um, how often did you see the defendant? Um Charles worked from home a lot, so uh, I would be at Lori's, and Charles would be there quite often. He would come to a lot of the activities we did with the children. Um, he was a, a constant presence. Okay, so you got to know Charles. How often would you see uh, Lori? Um, we would get together maybe once or twice a week. Okay. Um, and what sort of things would you do? We would go for walks together. Um, she's a hairstylist, so she would color my hair. Um, we would plan activities for the kids and um, go shopping in preparation for whatever we had planned for the next activity. Um, at next Friday. activity at church? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did there come a time where the Vallos moved from Hawaii? Yes. Did you maintain your relationship with um, the uh, defendant and her family? To an extent, yes. Okay. What do you mean to an extent? Um, I mean, we would stay in touch through phone calls or texts and then an occasional visit. Okay. Um, did one such a visit occur in um, early winter, uh, um, late winter, early spring of 2019? Yes. Do you remember when that visit was? I do. It was February of 2019. Okay. And uh, it was the weekend before Valentine's Day. Okay. How did that visit um, occur? Was it a planned visit? No, it was a very unexpected one. All right. Can you tell us about that visit? Uh, I received a call from Lori that she and Tylee had landed in Kauai. Um, she said that she was leaving Charles, had a lot to tell me. 
Um, they were checking into their hotel and that um, we would talk later. Okay. And did you talk later? We did. All right. How did that happen? Um, she reached out to me. Uh, they needed a place to stay. I offered my home as an option. And uh, her and Tylee came to stay with me the following day. All right. Um, did you have a chance to talk to her about her situation uh, back home? Yes. And when I say back home, in February of 2019, where did you understand from the de- uh, defendant, Lori Vallow, that she was living? In Arizona. Okay. Did she talk to you about what was going on in her home in Arizona? Uh, yes. She said that a lot had changed. Um, she said that her and Charles were going to be getting divorced, that Charles had had an affair. And then the conversation changed to where Charles wasn't Charles, that Charles was a demon named Ned Snyder. And the conversation just kind of evolved from there. Okay. So there's a lot in that answer. So let me make sure I understand. Um, You had a conversation that they were getting separated or they were divorcing? Initially, yes. Okay. Who Now, who was visiting with... Lori Vallow, when she was at your home at this time? Tylee was with okay. her. Where was JJ? JJ was with Charles, was my understanding. Okay. And um, did the defendant say why she didn't bring JJ? Uh, she said that she was done with JJ and that Charles and his sister Kay would need to figure it out. Okay. Um, and what did you understand that meant done with JJ meant? Taken into the context of she's going through a divorce, I took it to mean that if they went through a divorce, that Tylee would go with Lori and uh, Charles would take on the responsibility of JJ exclusively, was my understanding. Okay. Um, And during this, you also mentioned that um, she talked about um, that Charles was no longer Charles. Yes. All right. Um, What did she say about that? In terms of... When she said Charles was no longer Charles, how was that connected to her talking about separating from Charles? Sure. Um, So she had said that Charles was already dead and that there was a demon living inside him and kind of using his body as a host um, and that the demon's name was Ned Snyder. Did you follow up on that? Um, Did she give you any sort of evidence of this? Um, When I asked, how do you know that it's not Charles? She said, because he's shorter. Um, And did she ever talk to you about um, sort of um, that relationship in any other settings? As far as her relationship with Charles. I'm sorry, it's been a long day. Let me ask you a better question. Yeah, I'm not sure. Did she it. did she have any other conversations with you about Charles at any other locations other than at your home? During that visit? During that visit. Um it wasn't that week that she stayed with me. Um did it uh, was there another conversation later? Yes. Okay. Um was there any other conversations about uh, Charles that week she stayed with you? Yes. Tell us about the conversation that occurred that week she stayed with you. So during that week, um, apparently Charles didn't know that she was in Hawaii. And why do you say that? Um, because that's what she told me. Um, and she said that if Charles reached out to not tell him where she was and that he was um, had a private investigator kind of following her and that she had led him to believe that she was going to be in Idaho for a conference and that he was going to be having her served with papers in Idaho. What type of papers? Um, I, was, I assumed they were divorce papers. Okay. Um, any other conversations that week they were in um, staying with you in Hawaii um, that you can recall? Not really anything more than what we've already discussed. Okay. And earlier you indicated there had been additional conversations. Did they stay with you the entire time they were in Hawaii? No, they did not. Okay. So after that week they were with you, where did they go? Kauai Beach Resort. Okay. And um, did you have contact with uh, Lori Vallow while she was staying at the Kauai Beach Resort? I did. Okay. What contact was that? Um, So it was later in the month. 
um, and uh, she had been joined by Melanie Gibb. And so Melanie Gibb and Lori and I went out several evenings once we went out for an afternoon lunch and then a couple of evenings for dinner. Okay. Um, where was Tylee at this time? At this time, Tylee was, my understanding was she was back in Arizona working at her aunt's chiropractic clinic. Okay. And um, uh, was JJ now in Hawaii? No. Okay. Um, did you see JJ at all during the time the, the defendant was in Hawaii in February or March of 2019? No. Okay. Um, and so you said you went, you saw her a couple of more times with Melanie Gibb present. Yes. Okay. Can you think of, uh, you mentioned a lunch. Where was the lunch? We had lunch at a restaurant in Hanalei called Calypso. Okay. Um, and during that lunch, did the conversation of Charles come up? Yes. Or, uh, did the conversation turn to Charles? Yes. All right. And, um, how was that conversation? What was that specifically about? Uh, um, it was Charles. It was, I mean, a combination of things. There was Charles had sent an email to Lori's family, um, kind of pleading for help. And, um, she showed me the email and just again asked not me not to respond to Charles if he reached out. Um, okay. And, um, did uh was there another conversation about um Charles and communications with him um at one of the dinners you attended? The conversation about Charles was more about um now Melanie had joined the conversation and was kind of confirming what Lori was saying that Charles was not object to hearsay from Melanie Gibb. Um, well, Your Honor, I'm not offering it for the truth of the story that Charles was, in fact, possessed by a demon. I'm offering it to show context to what the defendant said in relation. That's, oh, so the objection is overruled. Thank you. So I'm sorry. What what did Melanie say? Do you mind repeating the question just so sure. I make sure I understand? At the, at the dinner that you attended um, um, where you and Melanie Gibb and um, Lori were present, um, how did the conversation with Charles or Char- her relationship with Charles come up? Um, the incident was brought up about um, Charles coming back from the airport where his car had been taken, um, his flight had been canceled, and just how angry he was about that taking place. Um, so when you say the incident, um, what does that mean? So there was an incident where... Charles had been on a business trip, and uh, Lori had discovered evidence of him having an affair. And as a reaction or a retaliation, canceled his flight, canceled his credit card, and moved his truck from the airport parking lot. And just kind of how that all unfolded and his reaction to that. Okay. And so um, did Lori Vallow tell you about that? Yes. Okay. Did Melanie Gibb? Cooperate that conversation. Yes. yes. Okay. In fact, did Ms. Gibb um, indicate who um, helped Lori in this? I don't remember exactly. Okay. So, um, did uh, during this conversation at the dinner, did anything else come up about um, uh, the Lori Vallow's relationship with Charles Vallow? Melanie was just confirming what Lori had told me about Charles being possessed by a demon. Okay. Now, um, during these various conversations, did the defendant ever talk to you about um, participating in the formation of the 144,000 who are supposed to shepherd in the second coming of Christ? Yes, that was a conversation the first night that she stayed with me when it was just she and Tylee. Okay. Um, And what did uh, Lori Vallow say to you about that? She said that she had been appointed a leader of one of the 144,000 and that she was there to gather me. And um, what did you understand gather you meant? Um, to join join her. Okay. Um, and what did she say was going to be needed for you to do in order to join her in this group? That I would need to be separated from my children. Okay. Um, did she indicate um, why? Um, basically that my children were raised, I'd, I'd fulfilled my role 
in their lives and that I had a greater calling, a greater mission to perform with her. Okay. And did she indicate um, that um, what you should do with your kids? Basically just leave them with their father. Okay. If I may have one moment, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. I have nothing further. Thanks, Judge. All right, Mr. Archibald, cross-examination. So Lori was in Hawaii, uh, lived there a year or two in 2016, 2017? Correct. And that's, uh, and you still live there? Mm-hmm. I do. And uh, you two were friends and uh, fellow church members? Yes, sir. And you say you had some kids. How old were they back then? Well, now they're, I'd have to do the math, but they're uh, 17 and 18 now. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so maybe 10 and 12 around there. Yes, sir. So during this visit in February of 2019, you were getting caught up with your, with your old friend, Lori. Yes, sir. And had you noticed a change in her belief system? Yes, so when you two were serving in your church together, uh, did she uh, believe in multiple lives or multiple creations? Not to my knowledge. Uh, did she mention that in February of 2019? Yes. Um, and did you ask her why she was changing her belief system? I don't know that I specifically asked her that question, um, but it was my understanding that her belief system had changed because of this group that she had recently become a part of. Okay. And so uh, previously when she lived in Hawaii with you in 2016-17, she she didn't have any what what would call uh, out-of-the-norm beliefs about Jesus. Not from my observation, no. And then in February of 2019, you noticed that her beliefs about Jesus had changed. They started to change a little bit prior to that. There was a visit before that 2019 visit in uh, July of 2018, and that's the first time. But but that was after she had moved to Arizona. Um, But that was the first time. And then uh, the visit in 2019, the beliefs were more amplified than before. Okay. So in July of 2018, where did you two visit? Uh, At Quiet Beach Resort. Okay. So that was also in Hawaii? Yes, sir. And uh, in 2018 or 2019, did she start to talk about uh, multiple lives being someone being someone else in a previous life yes and and did you believe in that no and did the church that you two attended together is that what they taught no uh did she in in july of 18 or february of 19 did she start to talk about zombies not in 2018, but in 2019. Okay. And uh, is, is that something that you two had previously talked about in, in Hawaii in 2016? No. So that was something new as well? Yes. How about uh, casting out evil spirits? Did, did Lori have that new belief that she had some power to do that? 
not that she shared with me. Okay. In July or of 18 or February of 19, <laughs> did, you, did you talk about castings? No. Okay. How about uh, a, a light and dark scales? Did you ever hear that? Or did she talk to you about that? Yes. And, and when was that? In 2019 in, at my home. Okay. And did you think that was unusual? Yes. Uh, certainly something that you two had never talked about uh, when you lived uh, in Hawaii previously in 2016. That's correct. <clears throat> did she tell you in 2019 that that she was a goddess? Yes. And what was your reaction to that? I just tried to not react and just listen to her. Uh, you mentioned that she said she was a leader of the 144,000. Uh, that happened in the February of 2019? Yes, sir. And had she ever mentioned that in 2016? Not in 2016, but in 2018. And did you ask her where she was starting or why she was starting to change her beliefs? It, yes, and it was that she had had some experiences um, in the LDS temple that had changed her view of herself and her life. And then she had found these like a group of like-minded individuals who had also had those same experiences. And and did you, when she was telling you that, did you believe it? No. And did you tell her that? Yes. And what was her response to you? Um, I don't think she was upset. I think she, I, I, my impression was she just thought I wasn't ready to hear it, maybe. Okay. Um, did she talk to you about uh, about setting up a new church called the Church of the Firstborn? No. When when you two you, you say you you served together in a in a branch in Hawaii. Is that in 2016, 2017? Yes. And, and what what organization was that? Uh, it's called the Primary. And the Primary is for children? Children 12 and under. And so uh, what did what did you and, and Lori spend time uh, in Primary teaching children? So you would teach from scriptures. Um, she has a strong background in music, so she, you know, did a lot of music time with the children. Um, we planned activities uh, for during the week, um, holiday parties. Um, we usually had one activity a week, and then um, the services on Sunday that we would plan and participate in. And so for these uh, activities and for the lessons for these children under the age of 12, uh, were they taught about Jesus? Yes. And that were they taught that Jesus uh, was good? Yes. Were, they, were these children taught that Jesus healed sick people? Yes. Um, that uh, were they taught that Jesus uh, cast out evil spirits perhaps I, I don't recall specifically okay but just uh, simple lessons about the love of God and uh, and how we need to be good people yes that was the, the subject of the of the lessons in 2016 yes and so uh, with your friend uh, three, two, three years later, you'd, you'd noticed that her focus wasn't on that anymore. It was on other things. Yes. Uh, 
And did you know Melanie Gibb uh, before she came and joined you that, that one time in Hawaii? No. That was the first time I met her. And was she, uh, uh, in her belief system, she was similar to Lori? Yes. That, that, uh, from the statements that Melanie and Lori were telling you about their their new beliefs, uh, were Melanie and Lori on the same page with that? Yes. And they they asked you to join? I think it was kind of like a, a subtle grooming is how I would describe it, just kind of testing the water to see my reaction. And But I could feel that the ultimate um, goal was to include me. Okay. And your response was, no thanks? Not interested. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, that then concludes the cross-examination. Does the state have any redirect? Very briefly, Your Honor. Very well. Sorry, adjusting it, Mr. Archibald's taller than I am. Um, now, um, ma'am, on cross-examination, you mentioned uh, this group that she was a part of. Yes. Um, was it your understanding she was one of the leaders of this group? I didn't know the hierarchy or, or the lead. Well, the leadership that I'm referring to is being a leader in gathering the 144,000. The group that I'm referring to is the podcast group that was described to me. Okay. I'm not sure if that distinction is necessary. Okay. Um, this podcast group, who was in it? Uh, the names that I was told were uh, Zulema Pastenis, uh, Melanie Gibb, Jason Mao, um, Thor, I don't remember his last name, Chad Daybell. Okay. Um, and um, the, the individuals in this podcast group, were they also committed to this uh, mission in helping form and pull together the 144,000? That was my understanding of how it was explained to me, yes. And that was explained to you by Lori Vallow? Yes. Nothing further. Thank you, Anna. All right. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Any recross on that? Okay. That will conclude your testimony then. Thank you for appearing and testifying today. Is this witness allowed to be excused? I would ask that she is. Any objection from the defense? No objection. All right, then you're excused from any subpoena you may be under, and I'll let you go ahead and step down and then address the jurors in the gallery here. <clears throat> All right, given the <clears throat> time at this point, then, we are going to recess for the day uh, in this Give me a moment. Before we do so, I just want to remind the jurors again, as I do each day, please don't talk to anyone else about the case. Uh, please don't do any investigation into the case, watch any news coverage of the case, or do anything else that could unfairly prejudice uh, what you're hearing here as the evidence in the case only so that your deliberations are based on just that. So I appreciate you following that admonishment every day. We'll request that you fill out your daily juror affirmation in the morning when you return, indicating you've complied with that. And with that in mind, we will break for the day and start again tomorrow morning at 8.30. All right, please. That wraps up the fourth segment of continuous courtroom coverage. Originally from the 19th of April of 2023, we're bringing it to you every single day. Be sure to press subscribe right here so you don't miss any of our coverage. I'm Tony Bruschi. Stay with us. This is continuous coverage. Continuous coverage. Continuous coverage. In the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell from the Hidden Killers podcast. Hidden Killers podcast.